The Marco Polo high-rise fire took four lives and caused more than 100 million in property damage. It also amplified the discussion about sprinkler systems and other safety issues for Hawaii's thousands of condominium dwellers. Will there be mandatory safety upgrades for older high-rise properties? Did all the controversy inhibit investigating the cause? The aftermath of Hawaii's worst high-rise fire. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Laura Yamada. The recent Marco Polo high-rise fire was not only responsible for taking the lives of four people, it caused more than $100 million in property damage, impacting 200 of the building's 568 units. Although no cause has officially been determined, there has been much discussion about sprinkler systems, fire doors, alarms and strobe lights, and what to do about upgrading the 358 high-rise apartment buildings built on Oahu before 1975. Buildings currently exempt from certain fire safety requirements, such as sprinkler systems. Who is responsible for addressing these safety concerns? Is this a shared responsibility between the government, the fire department, homeowners associations, and property management companies? Do other cities require upgrades for older high-rise structures? Our guests tonight include a city council member, a member of the fire department, and representatives of apartment owners and property managers. So we look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. All right, to our guests now. Socrates Bratakos is the Assistant Chief of Support Services for the Honolulu Fire Department. He oversees HFD's Fire Prevention and Training and Research Bureaus. Assistant Chief Bratakos is currently serving on the recently formed Residential Fire Safety Advisory Committee as ad Administrator and CODES Research Group Leader. Carol Fukunaga has represented a District 6 on the Honolulu City Council since 2012. The majority of the residential high-rise buildings in Honolulu built before 1975 are located in council districts 4, 5, and 6. Council member Fukunaga is an attorney and was previously a state senator for 25 years. Jane Sugimura is the president of the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners. She is also a member of the Residential Fire Safety Advisory Committee that was formed at the request of the city council. Ms. Sugimura is also an attorney at law by trade. And Darlene Higa is the 2016 and 2017 Oahu Chapter President of the National Association of Residential Property Managers. She has been in real estate for 27 years. Ms. Higa is the 2018 Pacific Region Ambassador for NARPM. All right, one more note before we begin. It has been widely reported that there are several litigation cases in progress related to the July fire at the Marco Polo condominium. Now, because of those legal actions, we'll not be addressing any specific information on the investigations or allegations, allegations about that particular fire. We focus more tonight on the immediate future and what's being done to address the concerns of the community and in particular the impact this has on thousands of residents living in high-rise condominiums throughout our state. It is everyone's goal to try and prevent a tragedy like the Marco Polo from happening again. But let's do a little bit of an overview here because uh, Chief, uh, you have a bit of an update probably for a lot of our viewers out there as to where we are with the investigation overall. You have some details you can share. Yes, Laura, that's true. The fire department's investigation of the fire as to its cause and origin is completed and the report was released to the public and uh, although the cause was officially undetermined, what that means is there's a number of accidental causes that could not absolutely be ruled out. We did find that the fire started in the apartment 2602 in the living room area and it was not a result of cooking, use of an accelerant, did not involve a drug lab or drug paraphernalia and was not intentionally set. That's very important. We did find out that 
There was a desktop computer plugged in, probably a tablet, an air conditioning unit, that there were some other items that could have been used in, in smoking, possibly unable to determine, mostly because the fire burned for a long time. So um, those items uh, will be passed on and private investigators will be looking at them, assigning them to some laboratories. Uh, if there is some further information that comes back in months or even in years, and that would uh, give us some more information to change the determination. And that's where we're at right now. So, you know, I think for people who haven't been deeply involved in this, they might think, my gosh, it's been more than three months. What's been going on? But there really has been a lot, in part because so many agencies are involved and this is so complicated and because it was so big. Uh, let's talk about uh, some of the things that have been happening on the, um, uh, in, in the government area and whatnot, and, and also with some of the committees that have been involved. Two, two groups have been formed uh, mm -hmm. so far, and you're involved in one of them. Yes, the uh, city council, you know, uh, immediately uh, took action as soon as Bill 69 was introduced to ask for the reconvening of something called the Residential Fire Safety Advisory Committee, very similar to what had been established in 2005 after a similar type of fire incident. And so uh, rather than, you know, all of us trying to become experts overnight, we said we ought to reconvene the same kind of grouping of experts, uh, lay people and, you know, government officials who can begin the process of coming up with recommendations and looking to see how best to address many of the concerns that people would have if you said you're going to have to automatically uh, install sprinkler systems within every single unit. So the uh, RFSAC has been underway for about two months. In the meantime... That's another group. There were two groups that were formed. Mm -hmm. There were two groups. One group was formed by the city council members. Okay. Uh, those members who had the majority of the older unsprinklered buildings in their council districts, which uh, is called the Permitted Interaction Group, or PIG, and our permitted interaction group uh, convened the community forum in September and we invited whomever was interested to come and attend the forum to ask their questions, to hear from a panel of experts, you know, on uh, fire safety, prevention and other kinds of topics. And so we took a lot of the questions that were raised and we com uh, compiled a report put the uh, responses to questions in the report and we posted that online as of the end of September. So at the October council meeting, uh, we officially you know, noticed the report and we had the report sort of stay um, in a dormant state and it was available to the public. We uh, could have taken any additional testimony if people sent us more comments, but we officially adopted that report during yesterday's council meeting. All right, so moving forward in that area. Maybe I'll start with you, uh, Chief. Uh, you all can talk about this, I'm sure, as far as the, the main concerns that were brought up during this hearing and through up until this point, and maybe some of the things that, that either, either haven't been raised or haven't been highlighted as much. Talk about what stood out to you, Chief. As I participated on that panel, I saw that there was a lot of people who came who were, had uncertainty. They were worried. A bill had come out saying that all the unsprinklered buildings would have to be sprinklered within five years. And that was pretty scary. And they didn't know how much it would cost. Again, 358 buildings uh, we're talking how about How necessary it was. There, the investigation had not been completed yet. And they came with a lot of questions. They didn't know if the government would be forcing them to do something against their will. Um, were there any alternatives? And in general, was there any other information that they could get? In particular, was there anything that they could start doing before a bill was passed or mm -hmm. any other measures were taken? And um, I'm glad to say that we could provide some information. Uh, Jane was there, council member was there as well. And uh, we all did our best to make some short presentations and then answer the questions of the people and, and address their concerns. 
Jane, were you surprised by some of the things that, that came up or some of the things that maybe people didn't realize and now this is a really big eye opener? Uh, I was, I mean, when we started working on um, the, uh, the life safety evaluation, which, you know, the fire department, you know, suggested. And this is uh, a, a, an evaluation that is uh, adopted, you know, it, uh, under national and international codes, I guess. Okay. And so it's, it's not how the, 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 the evaluation and the way the tool that uh, the fire department came up with, which is the matrix, you know, in order to evaluate the, to do the uh, in inspection is something that other cities have adopted. And, and it was just modified to address the buildings in Honolulu, you know, because we live in a place where we don't have snow or ice, right? So, uh, you know, things like open corridors, you know, if your unit opens out to an open corridor that leads to a stairwell, that's something that you don't see in mainland buildings. So what do you think, that, that's a good point, and I, what are all of you seeing as far as, besides the number of buildings that we're talking about here that we have to deal with, what else is making this particularly difficult right now to try and move forward quickly? I can tell you that, because the buildings that are affected, they have unit owners. And the buildings, the associations are uh, managed, they're, they're you know, operated through a board of directors that's elected by the, the people who own the units. And so it's like a democracy. And so if you, and, and the problem in, Hawaii, in, 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 in Oahu is most buildings, high rises, don't have more than 50% owner occupants. They live on the mainland, they live in China, they live in Japan. And so they're investors. And so if you want to make a change, uh, that means that you're going to have to get their vote. And if they're not responding to the correspondence from the board of directors as to we need to install fire sprinklers, will you approve the cost? I mean, it's, it's an uphill battle trying to, you know, uh, to, uh, trying to uh, get people to agree. And even if you have people who would like to do it, they're, they don't no, they, they don't want to vote for it because they think they can't afford it. I mean, the numbers that come out are millions of dollars. And if you're an apartment owner. To retrofit. And, to, to retrofit. And you do the math and it comes to, and says, oh, God, it's going to cost me $25,000. Can you write a check for $25,000? And, you know, you're going to, you know, sit back and say, wait, you know, maybe I have to go and get a loan. And, you know, how's it going to affect your lifestyle? What if it's more? What if, what if it's 50000 and then you have people who are on fixed incomes, mm -hmm. and they, they get a price like twenty five, thirty thousand that they have to write, you know. And it's not part of your maintenance fees; it's something that you have to write a check for now. You're talking about the cost per unit if if you if you own the the condominium. This yes. is the potential as to what the cost could be. Right. Well, I would say that uh, potential on the higher end yeah. of the range. I think it was something about six or seven thousand to up to. 20 something or so. At For something fully so, yeah. sprinkling, it's the including inside all the units, that was a range that we came up with about somewhere about there. Some of the lower estimates were seven up to about low 20. So that's just part of the reality. Mm -hmm. of what I think the, the key though is that for many of these unsprinkled buildings you know that were built before 1975 oftentimes they're in older sections of the city where mm -hmm. you may have uh, a number of residents who are elderly and so typically for a lot of these older condominiums cost is the big concern because in in I guess many instances the people who purchase those condominiums especially in urban honolulu like in makiki or punch bowl or downtown or in moili ili makali if they purchase the condominium that's where they're living you know they are still there and so oftentimes the owner occupants are in their 70s 80s 90s sort of like the marco polo examples and so the real question is how do we um pre prevent you know, more fire tragedies, while at the same time balancing the need to be sensitive to the needs of the residents in a particular building. I think that's it in a nutshell, right there, what the council member said. We want to prevent this. We have to be sensitive to the realities of cost. What is the best path to walk down to reach that objective? And Darlene, you, you 
talked wow. about how you've you've worked with the property managers. You talked to a lot of the owners. So you, this has been a learning curve. Yeah, they, a lot of them have asked, you know, what kind of costs or what they can do. So one of the um, mentions, the, one of the items she mentioned was the own absentee owners. So we manage a lot of properties that the owners don't reside here on the island. Um, we get the notices. We do forward them, send that to them. Um, a lot of them ask if you want to appoint someone as a proxy to, mm -hmm. to voice your opinion for the board meetings, and you know, majority of them don't. I mean, we can't force them to assign us as proxies, you know. Um, but that would be another way to get more, possibly more participation in, you know, board voting. Let me ask you a couple of quick questions here. We're getting some uh, viewer questions in. Some of them are pretty specific. Not surprising, people would want to know about their particular apartment, uh, you know, mm -hmm. if it's safe. Um, this is Lloyd asking, if the door of the source um, apartment had been closed, would that fire have spread? Is that something you can get into uh, or not yet? No, that's okay. If the door had been closed, it would have been helpful, but the fires get big enough then they break the windows or burn through the door and the drywall anyway. And that building fire, the elevator also failed on us and no one reported it to us until a passerby walked by McCulley Fire Station and we looked up and the fire was very large already coming out a window. So in that case, such a big fire that's breaking out a window and going up to another floor burning through the drywall or through the door itself, maybe that would not have helped, but we always say to keep the door closed. Mm -hmm. Keep that solid door closed. That's a big help in uh, preventing any fires from spreading. Speaking of solid doors, this viewer uh, also asking, how do I know if my front door is a, is a fire door? How would, I, how would I know that? Is it obvious? If I'm not mistaken, all exterior doors are required to be solid core, and mm -hmm. the garage right? walls so need to be, be fire rated. A certain, I don't know what the rating on that is, but the, the, on on the because in because I was on the committee, I had to I, I went and talked to my site manager. So we he showed me the doors are solid, and there and and the ones in the corridors, the ones that that open out to you know the uh, hallway doors have a metal plate and it tells you how and and it's it's screwed on to the door where the door hits the the jam and it's on there so it, it tells you your fire rating so i you know they walked me around and we checked all the doors and the plate is there so you can so you know that's that's one thing about you know the process is i'm learning and so i'm trying to educate other you know, people who live in buildings, that this is, you know, you got to walk around your building and look. And I, you know, one of the things is standpipes. So I have to look at my building and I have a standpipe at each end. And, so <laughs> and, and I think, uh, you know, we were talking about this earlier. Standpipe, not everybody knows what that means. Some of this is the terminology that people, right. they don't have on their minds yet. Um, maybe give a couple other examples of some things that, that you, as you, as you've been gone through this process again, you've said, "Oh, I, I, this is something well, that people one, should one check." This the, is one of the one of the items on the matrix is a vertical opening, and I didn't vertical know what a vertical opening, opening what is. What is a vertical opening? It's where you put a pipe or a conduit into a building, and the building code says, you know, because when you make the hole to put the pipe into it, it's not flush, so you have to put a seal so that there's no air between the the pipe or the conduit and the opening. Because if you have these openings, the, it spreads. The fire will go up. And so that's something a building site manager can do. And even if they were sealed originally, most of these buildings are 40 years old. Right. That seal could deteriorate. Mm -hmm. So that means you've you got to go and look at your seals on every floor to make sure that it's still there. You know, it's just like if you have the toilet with the, 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 the what is it? The wax, wax seal. seal. Wax, wax seal. seal. You yeah. have to make sure that it's there and it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and. But over time, yeah. it's, 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 not, it's not surprising. I'm not saying it's excusable, but it's not surprising because, you know, people's lives they're are busy and, right. and they're taking and so, care so of bills. People, you know, and, so yeah. I didn't even know this. So I, I had my site manager say, okay, I want you guys to start looking. You know, and, and they all knew what I was talking about. And you know, the, oh yeah, you, you, know, you have to have the seal on it. I said, has anybody checked in our building to see if the seals are still there? You know, because that's one of the things on the matrix. I'm sure that some of the, this is some of the discussions coming up with you yeah. as well. Is that something, I don't know if that's something that's required on a fire inspection? 
when they do their wet and dry standpipes? Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily the vertical okay. openings inside the units, but the elevator shaft and the stairwell uh -huh. and the stairwell doors, the door assembly must be sealed because okay. that's a way for smoke and fire to go through a building. So that elevator's got to be separated, the stairwell and its doors got to remain closed mm -hmm. and separated. And really, you need a qualified inspector to go into the units and see whether those other vertical openings for pipes and electrical conduits mm -hmm. have been sealed, like Jane was saying. That's very important in the event of a fire. Uh, Councilor, what else is some of the things that have come that came up in the the recent meetings that stood out well, to you? The interesting thing was that uh, you know people from all around the community had questions about the Marco Polo fire, okay. but they also uh, started raising a lot of questions about well, should we have fire drills you know regularly? Uh, should we you know let the fire department know? And one of the uh, panelists on our um, forum said, well, you know, he was a resident manager for one of the Waikiki condominium properties that's, um, you know, old and is would probably otherwise be eligible for um, uh, sprinklering every unit. But for his particular building, he said, you know, they have over 35 floors. So if you're going to be doing a fire drill, putting your residents, many of whom may be in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, through going up and down those stairwells may be more hazardous than any of the good that you might achieve. So he gave some recommendations for other alternatives, you know, education, sitting down with people, going through their individual units, you know, to kind of safeguard them. So I think the awareness out of these kinds of discussions discussions has really begun to register with people so that they're now, well, first of all, they want to know if something passes and there is a requirement, they want to know how they're going to be affected. But more broadly, I think they realize that for every building, people in the building should start organizing sort of a fire safety team or, you know, kind of a working group that will work with the management company and the condo association board so that over time it becomes an ongoing program. So As you might oh. imagine, our public education team, his section has gotten quite busy mm -hmm. in the last couple of months. So, um, Knowing the layouts of the building, mm -hmm. you know, the fire escapes, the stairways, um, things like that is what's mm -hmm. important. I think an important part of the education, too, is understanding the insurance situation. I don't think a lot of people realize, or maybe, you know, closely read the policy, and I, I think people are now, that there is a difference mm -hmm. uh, in how those uh, condos or apartments could be covered that people mm -hmm. didn't necessarily realize and they're learning it now. Maybe, yes. Jane, you can talk a little bit about that. Yes, well, I'm not an expert on the insurance, but I've been with Sue Savio so many times, I, th I think I, you know, I, I, well, I can explain it. You know, the building has got a master policy. And so the master policy only takes care of the common elements. So if your apartment, like if you had a, a unit at the Marco Polo and your apartment burned, the association would the association policy would pay for the common elements and put it back to its original condition. So if the, there was carpet on the floor that got burned, and let's say you had you you had nice wood floors, and it burned in the fire, if the original flooring was carpet, you're going to get carpet. So if you're you not going to get you your have extra insurance. Right. You would not be right. covered and, for and, those and, nice expensive hardwood floors. Right, and the the homeowner's policy is called an HL6 policy, okay, and and uh, Sue has been, you know, really good about talking about it, you know, w with apartment owners. If you had that, if you had that policy, then that will pay to uh, pay for your personal belongings. And if you had wallpaper on the walls, if you had curtains, the HL6 policy pays for it. N master policy does not because it's your personal items. And let's say you went in and you renovated your kitchen and put all new cabinets and a granite, you know, t uh, countertop. And if it burns, the master policy doesn't cover that. You're going to get back what it looked like originally when it was originally and built. That, that is the standard insurance for right. these types of condos. That's and pretty much what you can expect, that what it was when it was originally <laughs> built, that's it. Right. That's all that's And so, you know, so people have to start talking to their insurance company because, you know, after the Marco Polo fire, I went and I called my insurance. I said, can I see, 
can you e uh, email me my, you know, my, uh, the, the general description? And I looked at it, I was horrified because I had just renovated my, <laughs> I gutted my unit, I, wow. it's all renovated. So I says, you know, you got, you got to increase this coverage because I just spent, you know, X amount of thousands of dollars to renovate my unit. I got it, I got it, it's got to be covered, you know, under the H06 policy because if it, burns, I'm not going to get any of it back. I'm gathering a lot so of people don't realize So the properties this. that we manage, it's a requirement that we have an HL6 policy for, um, for our, our, people, from our clients. But you know, people don't look at the coverage. They just oh, give me an HL6 policy, and they just uh, get a standard policy. Yeah, yeah. And they, they have to look at it to say, OK, you've added, you, you took away the carpet, and now you've got wood floors. Or you've renovated your kitchen, and you've got brand new cabinets, all brand new appliances, and a granite counter. Mm -hmm. Temporary dwellings huh? also, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not going mm -hmm. to be covered. Right. Yeah. And your personal property, if you have, you could have, what, I think she told me there was somebody who called that was, he had 1,300 Aloha shirts. Okay. <sighs> and wow. That's quite a collection. Okay. And the <laughs> HSS well. policy covers that. You try to go after the association's master policy, you're going to get zero. Yeah. You know, and, and that's what people think. They think that the master policy is going to pay for all of these things, and it doesn't. And that's why, you know, several years ago, we went to the legislature to say that if, you know, the association, you know, if you could get 50% to agree to this insurance provision, then the associate, you know, everybody had to get an HL6 policy. And if you didn't have an HL6 policy, the association could acquire an HL6 policy for you and charge you for it. And that way, uh, they the could be, yeah, they could be sure that, but see, when you do that, everybody has maybe a standard HL6 policy. They don't look at it to make sure that it's going to cover mm -hmm. everything, everything in their unit. If they have diamonds and fur coats and, and I have you know, all of that in my, you know, <laughs> you know, artwork somebody on the, does, somebody you know, does somewhere. artwork on the wall and expensive stuff. A Picasso. Yeah, a Picasso. You know, if you don't, if you have all Real that or not, stuff, doesn't matter. you you've yeah. got to you've got to make sure your H O six policy covers that because the association's policy is not. And 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 then another thing is is that each building has got a deductible, mm -hmm. and the H O six policy would pay for that deductible, mm -hmm. but you got to know what your deductible okay. is. And so, if you, you know, if you have a standard, it's probably maybe five thousand, ten thousand. Some buildings have a twenty-five thousand dollar deductible. Wow! And then, so if you have a fire like it ha happens at the Marco Polo, and and you get hit with this deductible, and your policy is only a five thousand mm -hmm. dollar, you know, payment, I mean, then you're out of pocket twenty thousand dollars that you got to write a check for. Wow! And you know, so you know, we're hearing. I mean, I hear from Sue that there are a lot of people at the Marco Polo who, who, who think they're going to sue the building and get... But they didn't get that extra insurance. They, because they didn't mm -hmm. get that extra insurance. Yeah. And, you know, mm -hmm. unfortunately, now that there's a fire and they've lost everything, uh, it's too late. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's why, you know, people need to look at their policies to make sure that they have adequate coverage. Chief? Yes, yeah. and, well, and, and even more, when the fire damages a system such as the alarm system and it's older there's no parts available mm -hmm. anymore That's and a very then good our city ordinance the fire code will tell you to bring the alarm system up to a current cool. standard your insurance only covers that old one mm -hmm. interesting you've got to upgrade it let me get to a couple questions here um, fire retardant paint is that an option fire retardant paint is um, a help in uh, interior finish. We look at about 20 different factors for a building and interior finish, particularly of the corridors, the floor and the walls, and is one of them. And flame retardant paint is what we would call a class A finish. That's the best kind of finish that helps to inhibit flame spread. In my professional opinion, it does not take the place of automatic fire sprinkler systems, mm -hmm. but it is better than having uh, something else. True. Was, was this brought up, uh, Council Member? Uh, somebody was asking about having signs in buildings that do not have sprinklers, clear signs, so people can decide if they either want to enter or if they. Is that, is that required to have signage of some kind somehow? At this point, no, because. Okay. Buildings that are not sprinklered are not covered, you know, by the new requirements. So I think what 
Bill 69 would do is really take all of the old buildings that are currently unsprinklered and bring them under the requirements of sprinkler systems. So the question is, you know, how do we do that in a way that makes sense for some of the people who live in those kinds of buildings? Mm -hmm. But currently, uh, there's no distinction. What about apartment, um, let's see, apartment buildings on neighbor islands? We were saying this is, this discussion is primarily having to do with all Oahu. the older buildings here on Oahu. Are there, is there some discussion or action happening in some capacity on some of the neighbor islands or it's not, not they at just this don't point, have that? But I think for um, Jane and some of the other uh, uh, folks who work with the state legislature, you know, if it turns out that the costs are gonna be pretty significant and that we need to have possibly state and county assistance for people who may need some help, you know, in um, either installing the appropriate sprinklers or other kind of equipment in their buildings, then I'm sure that the uh, uh, other islands would want to join in the effort because whatever passes at the state legislative level will probably br bring up a lot of discussion for neighbor island residents. I think there are not so many high-rise residential buildings on on the neighbor islands that are unsprinklered, mostly because there's not many on the big island. Mm -hmm. The hotels are sprinklered. There's not on Kauai because they yeah. stop at four stories. And Maui, they were mostly built after 75, 76. So there's a few, some, and I, I know the issue has been raised, particularly on Maui, but not as big as over here. Let's take a look at what uh, some other cities have done. I think we have mm, uh, maybe about 10 or so different cities that kind of give you an idea that this really isn't, uh, univer there are universal standards here. Uh, cities are dealing with this differently. I think the first one we have up here is New York City. So the way they've handled it, at least up until this time, buildings <coughs> taller than 100 feet, um, they need to install sprinkler systems. Residential high-rise buildings must install sprinkler systems. If if the building has gone under significant renovations. Let's get through a couple more here. Let's see what we have next. Uh, Los Angeles, uh, high-rise buildings except residential dwellings constructed before 1974, required to be retrofitted with sprinklers. Uh, residential buildings erected before 1943 um, that are at least three stories high have sprinklers. So, I mean, this really, let's, let's do one more city here. Let's see what we have next. Uh, Chicago. This is this is one. I think Chicago and a couple other cities that we have on our graphics. They have not um, required retrofitting of sprinklers for residential buildings. So we'll get back to a couple of more. But I think this really just sort of is an example of how even on uh, on the mainland, on a national level, there is a lot of different perspectives. Uh, and actions on how people are handling this. It's not just here that we're having a tough time trying to find the right path. Mm -hmm. Chicago had a very tough fight. They ended up making an evaluation systems, but sprinklers were not required for residential buildings. They addressed hotels and business buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, Las Vegas and Houston and San Antonio did something similar to Los Angeles. They required sprinklers I think we have Houston. Go ahead. in the common areas, but not for the individual units. Florida, the whole state, has a law that requires a life safety, um, an engineered life safety system that may include sprinkling in the common elements and addressing the other systems such as fire alarms, smoke detectors, etc. So um, San Jose is the only city they required sprinkling of all its 11 high-rise buildings. Yeah, so. this is, San Jose is a good point, actually. I, I think we're getting to that slide in a minute. But I, I wanted to stop on that one because uh, it, it gives you, it, it makes you think about what the reality is mm -hmm. of trying to retrofit all the, they had 11 buildings, I believe, at the time for San Jose. There it is. They had, um, they went ahead and they retrofitted their buildings, but they had 11 11 that needed to comply. And it took them a decade just to get those 11 retrofit. We're talking again about 358 buildings here. And the, I think the mayor's initial proposal was for those to be required to be um, retrofitted in five years, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the Residential Fire Safety Advisory Committee took a look at that and 
The report is actually on its way through the administration to the city council and realize that that was a lot of buildings and a short time frame. So the first thing our, our group did is look and see, was it possible to exempt any of the buildings? And we saw that there was code provisions that were used in other places, especially Florida, which has a little warmer weather and we are able to recommend um, exempting buildings that have exterior balcony access only and buildings under 10 floors. So that takes out about 200 buildings away. Okay. And brings the number down to about 150. And originally the city council asked us, the chair, council members asked us, what are the riskiest buildings? And we said basically it's the tallest, biggest ones with full length interior quarters. That's what we will want to address no matter what we end up deciding. The full length do. interior quarter, quarters, why in, is that in particular? Because that's a place for fire to spread easily okay. from unit to unit. When it gets outside the door or even from a window or stairwell, then it has access to travel, especially in our city that has nice winds all the time. Mm -hmm. I think one example of uh, what Chief Protakos is talking about would be something like uh, Kukui Plaza or Queen Emma Gardens. You know, these were great projects at the time that they were built, mm -hmm. but they were built with interior corridors. And very similar to the um, mm -hmm. Marco Polo example, you know, they had uh, solid doors, but then they often had louvers, you know, in the bottom or in the top. Mm -hmm. And so with those interior corridors, you had cross ventilation, which was probably ideal at the time they were built. But as time has gone by, that type of construction has been uh, eliminated. That's no longer permitted, partly because of the spread of fire. So, you know, when you think about some of these uh, very uh, wonderful, you know, buildings and structures, many of them are also vulnerable because of the way that they were constructed. Now, now, Jane, you've publicly stated that forcing condo owners to install sprinklers, you're saying it, it's not actually feasible. Uh, expand on that a little bit. Well, under the mayor's bill, he, he, at that time it was 358 buildings, and there aren't enough companies in town to, to complete the retrofitting. You know, so it's unrealistic, and nobody, not, there's not one condo in Oahu who's got it in their budget. Condominiums have a budget. Okay, and so and there's a law, a state law that says you, you shall make a budget and you will you know, de have a reserve study done and, and the reserve study tells you how much money you have to sock away every month right. so that 20 years from now you're going to have enough money to do the roof so you don't have to do a special assessment. So those reserves, that's not necessarily going to cover what we're talking, is that what you mean? Right, so if, you have no, if, you, if somebody tells you you got to uh, do a retrofit, and you look at your budget and you have zero dollars. You have zero dollars, so that means, what are you gonna do? You're gonna assess everybody in the building. And so if the cost is $14 million, you do the math. You take the number of units, divide it into, into the amount, and somebody's gonna have to write a check. Or you can go to the bank and borrow the money. But if you do that, you need 50%, over 50% of your unit owners to approve the loan and if, all, if none of the 358 buildings have it in their budget, that means that you have to have banks who are ready to loan money to 300 and, you know. And some of the exemptions talking about, re you know, reducing uh, fees, you know, reducing uh -huh. um, the uh, percent as far as those loans go, uh, various things here and, here and there, but, but still. And also making a much longer time frame. Much longer. So time. yeah, so so that five years was expanded out. Again, San Jose, eleven buildings. Oh 10 yeah, years. yeah. So the uh, research groups, first of all, the first suggestion was go to twelve years because that's what the fire code said. And uh, so actually, there's some benchmarks for partial sprinkling to be done at, at about eight or ten years. For the full sprinkling, it'd be done in twelve to fifteen years. That's the recommendations there going to the city council because Jane's right to to time work for all those buildings that don't have uh, that money in their reserves yet um, you have to afford 
additional additional time. But the good thing is, I think, you know, with this year's discussion, we have the benefit of the 2005 RFSAC uh, working group mm -hmm. that did come up with a list of about 10 different financing alternatives, you know, both state and county types of uh, assistance, as well as more traditional loans, et cetera. Uh, so I think between the number of buildings that are actually, you know, likely to be impacted by the recommendations of the amendments to Bill 69 that the committee is coming forward with and then asking buildings who might be, you know, uh, likely um, candidates for having to in retrofit their units, we would have a much better idea of what the total impact might be for those remaining buildings and how will the uh, residents in those buildings, you know, um, be able to come up with the specific dollar amount. So I think we'll have a lot more information than was available previously. I think in the 2005 instance where, you know, it was being talked about in sort of a vacuum, you know, more in the context of all buildings. Uh, nothing was ever adopted, partly because there was this really unknown quality about, you know, how big the scope of the problem really was. So I think with the recommendations, the uh, committee is including in its report a listing of all those buildings, you know, that would be most likely required to install sprinklers. So for those of us who represent, you know, areas with a lot of those buildings, we can encourage the individual condominium associations and their owners to review the recommendations look to see how they would be impacted, and then give us their feedback as to how it would impact the residents in their building. Here's some feedback from Boyd. He was asking, city, could the city sponsor a sort of improvement district that could do a bond issue to pay a substantial part of fire sprinkler upgrades, then residents could repay that over time? Is that a possibility? That was one of the topics that was discussed during our community forum, and I think that will be among one of the uh, list of you know different financing alternatives that's included in the RFS SAC report. If yeah, that was included in the white paper, mm -hmm. another so concern um, I think that some of our clients have brought up is the cost and when if I sell my unit or you know how does that impact mm -hmm. because that transfers over if you can't. Pay. You either got to pay it or the new owner has to pick that up too. So that's a concern if each homeowner is assessed. And you when know, you were talking about dollars. the breakdown of, okay, where are we going to get the money? Uh, a lot of these owners know that uh, it, maintenance fees and other types of fees are likely going to go up to try and pay for this. And there are mm -hmm. a lot of people in these areas that can't afford to pay another $50, $100, $200. Right. added the cost. Mm -hmm. That's a tough fight. And tough, I, tough I find out that a lot of people are actually not aware that they need to maintain these other systems, standpipes and alarm systems and doors and that the, the buildings and their boards have not all been necessarily educated on the necessity, in fact the requirements per code and ordinance to maintain those and sometimes they have been reluctant to upgrade their elevators or alarm systems or hanging on by a thread and they really n need to move on those issues even whether or not fire sprinklers are, are put in the building. I think the good thing is you know today with the internet uh, all of the information that we have received so far has been posted online, mm -hmm. you know, through the council's website. Uh, when we have the report coming from the managing director's office, you know, people will be able to review and evaluate how it will impact, you know, their particular building, and then they can comment and get mm -hmm. back to us, and then we can tweak the bill based on the feedback that we get and the intended. Yeah, there's a lot of things to think about in that report that I think people aren't aware of or hadn't thought to think of. Let me ask you this question real quick from another viewer. I understand that even if a law passes mandating retrofitting sprinklers in older condos, an individual owner cannot be forced into installing a retrofit, true or false? Jane could best answer that. Right now, um, it's probably that's true because the state law that creates condominiums defines what a condominium is. And it is what is the, what is the owner's responsibility and what is the uh, association's responsibility. 
and that's anything inside the interior walls. So does that create a, another situation of liability, though, depending on what happens if something happens? Well, that, no, see, that's the problem. When you, when you have, um, when, 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 when you try to insert, uh, try to put the sprinklers in each unit, that's the problem. And until you change the state law or you, you make a law that says that the government can somehow mandate this, it's not going to happen because legally, inside the interior wall belongs to the unit owner. The association cannot tell them what to do. I mean, the association has rules about you need to keep it neat and clean. You can't, you can't let it, you know, you know, you can't let it get so filthy that you have roaches that come out and you know invade other <laughs> units. You know, you can't, you know, be a hoarder and have newspapers that go to the ceiling because that's a fire hazard and that's Which a I dangerous. I think that was brought up in your discussion. <laughs> <laughs> you have to a have concern. a smoke alarm, at least yes, right. one in your apartment that works. You know, and I think a lot of this goes to as this discussion moves forward. There's some consideration that has to happen with whether or not the language in the law itself is going to be changed. You know, you brought up the issue of um, having to have a certain percentage agree to be able to move forward. Um, there's a number of things that need to be considered with the ch not only adding things. Well, at both the state changing. and the county level, because mm -hmm. condominium language. law is really at the state level. It's not, you know, part of the city's uh, zoning or building code uh, regulations. So condominium governance is really state regulation. So we actually would have to work pretty closely mm -hmm. in conjunction with state lawmakers and state regulatory bodies at the same time that any changes are considered. Yes. You know, Laura, what's been making me hopeful is that so many people are getting educated, the city council's taking notice, the legislature's picking up on it, and we have these 360 buildings that will be around for a long time. You can think of them as infrastructure of the city, although they're privately owned. And now together, all of us, all us stakeholders and committee members are thinking, what are we going to do about these buildings over a long time? And this is where the answers start to get generated. This is a, a, a viewer question, but also I'm sure it was brought up in the media. Technology. We're talking about the immense cost here for having to retrofit some of these buildings. What are some of the uh, potential... Um, uh, solutions that could come out of technology that you guys have seen so far. This uh, Phil asking about um, are there much smarter fire alarms that will, will use Wi-Fi maybe to notify your phone or yes. links to alarms. I think there's a number of, of different there types were of technologies a number that of, have been used uh, in different areas. Questions that came up and you know I think the uh, fire department did cover a number of different technologies. We also talked about uh, how the fire alarms are connected to your elevator systems and you have a lot more uh, flexibility today than what you would have So is that an option to possibly reduce costs? Is that being well, oh, the, the new alarm systems, yes, they may um, be wired by being Wi-Fi's. That is a possibility. And um, another thing is improving the alarm system, like the council member is saying, when the buildings do have to do it, that will tie the alarm system into the elevators, into the doors for the stairwells, possibly into the smoke detectors. That upgrade alone is making the building uh, safer. Uh, if a sprinklers were installed, whether in the common areas only, which a lot of cities do just because it's so tough, or in all the units, which is very safe, they would also talk to the sprinklers. We've got the internet of everything these days. Mm -hmm. All the mm -hmm. devices talk to each other, and we can mm -hmm. track them all yeah. over time. Yeah. Too. Quick question from Wailana. How does one find out what the homeowner's coverage is under the building's insurance policy. Do you just talk to the property manager? I'm sorry, what was the question? How does one find out what the homeowner's coverage is, um, or maybe a condo owner, I guess, uh, under the building's insurance policy? We can get the master policy from the So talk to the property manager about that. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and, and you can get that, and they do it every year. I yeah. mean, they give you, uh, they give the unit owners a copy of the coverage, it's standard. Okay, so maybe she yeah. needs to ask. So if this is a renter, she the... may have to ask her landlord. Okay. So what else, um, let me ask you, Darlene, what, what else, are, or what are property managers saying, um, and the folks you were saying, this is what 
we, we want to happen, or this is what we think is realistic. What, what are you... Well, I think until we don't know what the law is, we can't inform our owners what we need to do. So in the meantime, with our tenants, we just want to make sure that the smoke detectors are there, that's required. Um, if it's hardwired smoke detector, make sure that's um, hooked up. We had one that we checked and it wasn't even wired. So just doing that, just take appropriate measures, you know, safeguard yourself and do what you can until we know what's required for us to do. And Jane, we talked about the cost. This is a comment really from <laughs> Julia. She's saying, in Honolulu, many older buildings are already being retrofitted for decaying drains and sewers. Currently, for her, that's $50,000 yes. that she's having to deal with. So how, how are they going to pay for, for other? So, so what, are, what are your recommendations? What do you see as realistic moving forward? Well, Looking at you know the what you know what the committee has come uh, has uh, recommended in the report, uh, I personally think that the life safety evaluation is a good uh, uh, result, and the fact that you know under the the changes that are being submitted to the city, every building, even the ones who are exempt, would have to go through a life safety evaluation to make sure that their building is safe, and. What I would like to see is, you know, uh, if, if, if a building, you know, can, doesn't get a passing score, that they be allowed to make corrections or upgrade their systems cause, and, 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 you know, they could probably do it cheaper than doing retrofitting. And if they choose to do retrofitting, that's a decision that the association can make. I mean, and, and they can then decide to, you know, set aside money and, uh, and you know, uh, come up with e e enough money, you know, to to pay for it. But you know, it's it, it's it's very difficult because each building is different. Uh, you know, some have a lot of owner occupants, and so it's 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 easier for the board to you know uh, get a decision. And if you have a 20% owner occupant ratio, that means you know you've got 30% of the people that you need to get votes from you know, don't even live in the building. Some don't even live in the country. You know, and that makes it really hard to make these changes. Uh, and um, but you know, what I what I would like to see is, is is you know the use of the matrix so that the and, and you know all buildings, as part of their budget and reserve, all high rises have elevator renovations. And but it's a huge, it's a huge cost. It's over a million dollars to do elevator renovations. No, I, no. And. <laughs> And some buildings have been putting it off. I mean, what they do is they just move it down the road because they want to use 100000 to do Knowing the, the cost that we're talking about here, um, Council Member, what do you want to focus on? We've got a couple more minutes. I'm okay. To the chief well, I think the, the key thing that, that, that I see we really need is uh, we need to hear from people once they take a look at which buildings are affected. They need to, to take a look at how they will, you know, um, deal with it if they had to pay for some of these improvements. And then that will give us an ability to look at what are some of the best financing alternatives. Because I think it's going to have to be a combination. You know, some government assistance, maybe some state assistance, maybe some county assistance. But until you know, you know, whether, say, all 160 buildings have elderly populations, you know, in excess of X percent, it is hard for us to structure uh, what the range of alternatives should be. So it's, it's more of a communication and feedback loop that I think we're looking for at this point. Because once those recommendations are public, then people have to apply them to their own circumstances. And Chief, uh, with the last bit of time that we have here left, I wanted to throw the last question to you. Uh, you know, at, at this point in the discussion, what we've learned so far, the progress that we've made, what do you want to see happen? What do you think needs to happen? Well, I'd like to see our older buildings be safer. As best as we can determine as a community, you know, we're all in it together and we all make a decision. We collect data and we formulate the best objective. As a, as a fire chief, I want people to be safer and I want firefighters to be safer when a fire occurs. I, I will make my best recommendation to our decision makers, and I hope that we come out with a good solution. Well, thank you so much, all of you, uh, for joining us. This is, we've had a lot of your questions. Not surprising, because this is a big concern. 
uh, I think this is an eye opener for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, are you, are you happy with the progress that's been made so far? I think we've made a lot more progress in a short time this time around than perhaps may have occurred 10 years ago. And so that's very encouraging. Well, mahalo to all of you for joining us tonight. And of course, we thank our guests, Socrates Ritakos from the Honolulu Fire Department, Jane Sugimura from the Hawaii Council of Associations, and apartment owners, and Honolulu City Council member Carol Fukunaga, as well as Darlene Higa from the National Association of Residential Property Managers. Thank you again so much. This is an important discussion. Lots going to be happening over the next few months as well, trying to figure out how we can all kind of come together with so many different parts to talk about. All right, next week on Insights, in his State of the State address earlier this year, Governor David Ige said, if we're going to diversify and strengthen our local economy, we need to change our education system. So next week, the leadership of our public, private, and charter schools will come together for a conversation about how to make these major changes in education to prepare students for a very different employment landscape. Representing Hawaii's private schools, Phil Bossert from Kamehameha Schools, Holo'ua Stender, Sione Thompson from the State Public Charter School Commission, and Phyllis Unebasami will be here for Hawaii's DOE. That's next. I'm Laurie Amata for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Ohui ho.